This is Season 1, Episode 32, and you are listening to an After Dinner Conversation magazine podcast. After Dinner Conversation believes humanity is improved by ethics and morals grounded in philosophical truth, and that truth is discovered through intentional reflection and respectful debate. In order to facilitate this process, we've created a growing series of print books, a monthly short story magazine, and two different podcasts. This podcast, Philosophy Ethics Short Story Audiobooks, provides audiobook readings of stories that have appeared in our magazine, and our companion podcast, Philosophy Ethics Short Story Discussions, is where we discuss the ethics of the choices made in the stories as a way to model the kinds of discussions we hope you're having about these readings with friends, family, or students. We would love it if you'd go over and check it out as well. In fact, we discuss the ethics and decisions made in this very story in our companion podcast, After Dinner Conversation Discussions, in episode 16. So, when you're all done listening to this audio podcast, head over to our companion podcast and listen to our discussion of this story. We'll include a link in the description. And of course, you can always continue the discussion on our webpage, in the comment section, or on our Facebook page. I am Colby, your narrator and the creator of After Dinner Conversation Publishing. Thank you for spending your time listening to our podcast and for reading the magazine. Thank you for supporting us through your magazine subscriptions and through patreon.com forward slash after dinner conversation. And of course, if you enjoy this audiobook reading, please subscribe to our podcast, share it on social media, and suggest it to friends. Today's story is by David Schultz, and it is in the May 2021 magazine. The name of the story is Abrahma's Endgame. Abrahma had been summoned to the Grand Temple by one of the more fascinating outsiders, the paladin Sir Godel. Between stone pillars, the crowd bustled with the trailing cloaks of shadow elves, the glimmering pauldrons of paladins, the broad shoulders of her orc brethren, and the small skittering bodies of goblins. Abrama always watched carefully. Even now, she recognized the difference between the natives and the outsiders, physically identical, but nonetheless altogether different beings. An elf popped into view, moved erratically, then disappeared, all typical behaviors of the outsiders and more or less exclusive to them, back to whatever world from which they had come. None of the other natives seemed to notice. They never did. Abrama wasn't like them. She had the understanding of the outsiders. She could converse with them in their alien tongue, which she had learned by listening. But, like the natives, this was her only world. She had never left it and never seen that realm from which the outsiders came, appearing and disappearing from her world at will. She longed to understand who these beings were, really, and where they came from. Now, summoned by Sir Godel, she felt she may finally have an opportunity. Godel emerged from the crowd, gleaming sheen across his enchanted armor. He had been powerful and accomplished since she had met him on the day of her birth. Then she had stood before him as a novice, perhaps accomplished as a huntress, but not yet in the secret knowledge she now contained of the outer world, of his world. I'm sorry, he said. For what? For what I have to tell you now. And what is that? She listened while he delivered the bad news. It's not every day you find out your world is going to end. Abrama thought she was taking it pretty well. I'm sorry, Godel said again. It's out of my control. Please forgive me. No, Abrama said. No, I don't forgive you. Now, if ever, was the time to be direct. You owe me an explanation. I have so many questions. What do you want to know? Why have you watched me since I was born? Why have you never explained who you are? Who are the outsiders? Where do they come from? Why am I different from the other natives? I suppose I can answer your questions, Godel said. 
It doesn't matter now anyways. You've figured out there's a difference between the natives and the outsiders. There's no easy way to say this, Brahma. We, the outsiders, created your world. As a game. A place where we could play. But now we have to end it. So we're just playthings for you? Not for me, Godel said. I wasn't here just to play a game. What do you mean? I am a researcher in my world. I create minds. Your world was a place to test my creations. And you, Abrahma, I am one of your creations? Yes. In one swoop, she had met her creator, learned the reason for her creation, and that her world was coming to an end. Or perhaps it was. Because the outsiders, although something like gods, were not omnipotent. Godel, of course, was limited. He was constrained by his own people. Their society, like her own, functioned by a balance of power. And so that balance could perhaps be tilted. Perhaps Godel, her outsider creator, was resigned to the fate of her world. But Abrahma was not. Ben Cook loosened his tie, wiped a bead of sweat from his head, and stared back at the dozens of suits staring in his direction. A congressional hearing, and he was in the hot seat. There were a lot of problems he anticipated when he started his video game company, but being accused of running an illegal black market and money laundering operation was not among them. Congressman Stephen Simons leaned into his microphone. You are the CEO of Maelstrom Entertainment, is that right? Yes, Ben Cook said. Your company created the Land of Legends computer game. Yes. Your video game world has a marketplace with an exchange with U.S. dollars. Is that correct? That is correct. Congressman Simmons looked at a paper on his desk. The GDP of Land of Legends is 1.2 billion USD. Is that correct? I don't know the exact figure, Congressman, if it even makes sense to speak of such a thing. Evaluations of a market are complex, based on a lot of competing assumptions and different data. Okay, Mr. Cook, is the figure of $1.2 billion in the approximate range of a reasonable estimate as far as you are aware? I don't think I'm qualified to answer that, Cook said. You should ask an economist. Simons almost let out an exasperated huff. Almost. Your game has a currency called GP, or gold points. This can be exchanged anonymously for U.S. dollars at an exchange rate of 1,000 GP per $7 USD. Is that correct? I'm not aware of the current exchange rate. Is the exchange rate I just quoted, 1,000 GP per $7 USD, within the range of exchange rates in recent history? I suppose it is. If we extrapolate from this rate, we can calculate a value of 1.2 billion GDP for the entire Land of Legends marketplace. What I want to know, what this is all really about, Mr. Cook, is how you control the transactions occurring within this marketplace, which is, in point of fact, larger than several countries. It's a video game, Cook said. This was his trump card. Most people didn't really believe that a world that existed entirely within a video game should be taken seriously, and certainly shouldn't be assigned metrics like GDP alongside real, tangible markets. Players use imaginary currency to buy imaginary goods. Magic swords and dragons. Tell me, Congressman, what is the U.S. dollar value of an ice dragon? How much should the government tax imaginary creatures? Simons paused, apparently flustered, but he kept going. A relentless, practiced politician. Here's a simple yes or no question, Mr. Cook. Is it not true that your virtual market can be used to conduct transactions for real goods? That's true. I understand your virtual marketplace uses an anonymous encrypted protocol for all transaction. Is that correct, yes or no? That is correct, Congressman. So you have no way of knowing, do you, who is trading money with whom? Well, there are always ways to try to identify who's involved in a transaction based on, for example, past behavior or signature profiles and so on. Yes, yes, but you're talking about an investigation based on pieces of evidence, 
What I want you to confirm is that there's no way for your company to know directly who is involved. That in fact, your company has expressly designed the economy of Land of Legends to protect the identity of those involved in the marketplace. Yes or no, Mr. Cook, can you, for any given transaction, determine definitively who is exchanging what with whom? Can the U.S. government determine with paper currency, Congressman? That's not what we're discussing today, Mr. Cook. We are discussing the operation of illicit black markets using virtual currencies that are presently outlawed by the Cryptocurrency Efficient Commerce Act. Yes or no, Mr. Cook? Can you effectively determine who is exchanging what with whom on your network? There was no way to obfuscate this, no way to deflect the issue. It was true, not by design, of course. Land of Legends wasn't intended to function as a perfect digital black market, guaranteeing anonymity and a stable exchange rate and encrypted transactions. But with its popularity, that had become the routine. And that made the system illegal, technically. This was it, then. He could admit it. No, Cook said. We can't. So he would have to patch the system, remove anonymity. It would mean wiping the current world, though. A lot of players would revolt. It would cost a lot of money. But it wasn't the end of the world. Our world may come to an end, Queen Abrama said. Assembled around the grand table were all the members of the Council of Secrets, those unique natives from around the world who, like her, were gifted with the capacity to learn and understand the language of the outsiders and comprehend that there was something more to their existence here. There was another world beyond their own, the world of the outsiders. Jeradai, Prince of the Shadow Elves, and her High Commander, Kenazo, High Elf of the Endless Forest, King Helm Halls, fearless leader of the human kingdom, they'd all risen through the ranks, through their exceptional abilities, had become masters of their respective domains. But the Council of Secrets was not the cause of their success. Rather, it was the consequence of their special nature, which Abrahma now understood to be a gift from the outsiders. They were created by a researcher, the paladin Sir Godel, as experiments in a world that was created for the most trivial of purposes. They were tests, experiments in the creation of minds, an attempt to create smarter and better things within their world. They had succeeded insofar as Obrama and the others commanded vast wealth and armies and power, but their existence was meaningless, just a game. Or was it? She existed now. That is what mattered. Her existence was the basic fact. The preconditions of her creation were a circumstantial tangent, irrelevant except for perhaps academic interest and for strategy. What did you discover, Kenanzo said, always the first to leap at knowledge and secrets? We've long suspected the outsiders to be a different class of being, visitors from another plane. How they appear and disappear at will how they move with mysterious purpose and speak of incomprehensible things beyond our world. What I discovered from one of the outsiders that we might have once called a god is that we were created, not for any high or noble or grand purpose, but as their playthings. And for reasons that I am still struggling to comprehend, they are planning to destroy our world, to replace it with another that is more in accordance with their goals. What can be done Jiradai said, a man of action, her high commander. The outsiders are not gods, Abrahma said. They are people no different from ourselves, in their essence. They have limitations, and they must have weaknesses. I am not resigned to the fate they have decreed for us. I believe the world is worth saving. Our time is not done here. As you know, we are not constrained to acting wholly in our own world. Through our interactions in the market with the outsiders, we can affect their world. We can provide gold and services and magical equipment from our world in exchange for services in theirs. We know they value these things. They spend their time here. They fight alongside us and die alongside us. They will trade with us, even if we ask in exchange for them to act in their world instead of ours. That is what we must do. What are we authorized to devote for this mission? 
We are fighting for the survival of our world, Abrama said. You have total authorization. All the kingdoms are at your disposal. All of our wealth, all of our soldiers, all of our magic. We will protect the land of legends, whatever it takes. Alison Godel sipped the glass of water, cleared her throat, and prepared to defend her beloved AI creations from obliteration by the blind cudgel of an overbearing government. Professor Alison Godel, she introduced herself. I'm a computer science researcher, artificial intelligence specifically. What is your involvement with the Land of Legends computer software? This was her moment. She couldn't hope to save the world entirely on her own but maybe she could sway people in her direction. Government people are people, after all. The Land of Legends platform gave a tremendous opportunity to researchers of all types. The free, open nature of the virtual environment provides a robust simulation that has proven invaluable for various research projects across disciplines, including testing economic and sociological models. Over two dozen peer-reviewed papers have been published, many in high-impact journals, using the environment of Land of Legends as their sole source of data. Excuse me, but the question, my involvement was following in the footsteps of these researchers, using Land of Legends as a testing ground for research in artificial intelligence. I have made tremendous progress, and Land of Legends has been invaluable in my research. It's the nature of your research that concerns me now, Professor Godel. I understand that you produce intelligent agents, bits of software that act autonomously within the Land of Legends framework. Is that correct? That is correct. What is it about Land of Legends that makes it such a fertile ground for your type of research? Land of Legends has intentionally allowed programmers such as myself to insert artificially intelligent agents. Other platforms consider this cheating. Unlike other platforms, I can safely conduct research there without fear of my projects being shut down. How many agents have you placed in Land of Legends? This was a hard question. Between testing and prototypes, controls and variations, there were thousands. Currently, there were a few dozen active agents. The most interesting set, her newest iteration, and the most promising of all, Queen Abrama. But the congressman didn't need to know the details. It's difficult to say. I've placed many over the years as part of an iterative process. The vast majority are defunct, failed projects. Approximately how many have you produced in total? I would say approximately five to 6,000. I would like to move now to the marketplace interactions. Are these artificially intelligent agents capable of interacting in the virtual marketplace? Yes, that's very much the point. The agents are capable of participating in the economy, which allows us to test our models in a realistic economic context. Land of Legends is a highly market-driven game. Is there any way of distinguishing between transactions conducted by human agents and transactions conducted by machine agents? This is part of what makes the platform so interesting for researchers such as myself, Congressman. The software agents are equal participants, and their behavior can be made to approximate human participants. It's kind of an economic Turing test, in a way, conducted through virtual market activity. That is very academically interesting, Congressman Simon said, but I find it troubling. If I understand you correctly, you're saying that an army of machines is conducting untraceable trades in an encrypted and anonymous black market. Do you understand my concern? I'm not sure I do. Let me put it this way. Previous experts have testified that Land of Legends is used as an illicit black market. Others have proven that it has been used for money laundering entirely untraceable. Tell me, Professor, can your machine agents participate in these types of illicit actions as well? I suppose they could. And being entirely autonomous and anonymous, you wouldn't have any way of knowing, would you? I suppose not. The expert testimony did not go as Allison had planned. She was right to say goodbye to Queen Abrama. They were probably going to patch and overwrite the NPCs after all. Queen Abrama stood aside Commander Jaredi, across from the ragtag band of Rat-9 clan warriors. 
The Rat Nine clan was a ragged band of foul-speaking thieves and criminals, all of them outsiders. Abrama's spy network had investigated them thoroughly. In their world, they were known as hackers and trolls and wielded the power to disrupt their society. Here, they were just as noxious, repellent, and for better or worse, potent. They carried banner symbols that Abrama learned were offensive in the outer world, a geometric shape called a swastika, two circles joined to a rounded central column called a penis. And their names, merely foreign to Abrama's ear, were chosen to be distasteful to outsiders, for reasons that were frustratingly beyond Abrama's comprehension. The Rat Nine clan leader was called Dildo Faggins. The Rat Nine clan were bad guys, but they were powerful in their world and hers, and right now she needed them. Here it is, Dildo Faggins said, holding up a shimmering crystal the size of a skull. Now where's our shit? Hold on just a minute, Jaredai said. How are we to know the beacon operates as we requested? Stop talking like that. We don't give a fuck about OOC bullshit. Obrama only had an inkling about the meaning of this term, OOC, that it was invoked exclusively by outsiders and usually presaged some talk about matters outside of the land of legends, a signal that talk of their world was forthcoming. How does it work, Jaredai said. Exactly as we fucking said it would. It sends an anonymous encrypted signal at regular intervals through an onion network. If the signal doesn't get through, probably because they wiped the server, then the decryption key for the leak is released. If our world is destroyed, Obrama said, then the crystal will cause damage to yours? Sure, right. It does what you told us to make it do. Now, where's our shit? Obrama told Jaredai to conduct the exchange. Jaredai traded 1.5 million GP to Dildo Faggins for the crystal beacon over the secure market. Keep that shit safe, Dildo Faggins said. People are going to come for it for sure. I just have one question for you two faggots. Obrama recognized this as a term from the outsider lexicon as signaling intentional offense, a juvenile mindset, and a show of disrespect. Yet she hadn't met with Rat Nine because of respect, but for utility. What is your question? Abrama said. Who are you guys, really? That's none of your concern, but I assure you, you will hear from us again. Our time is not done here. The U.S. Cyber Defense Department had been established to protect the government against computer threats. Director Marion Renard had always envisioned defending against hackers, protecting infrastructure, keeping their most secure data safe, being vigilant against new attack vectors, ferreting out weaknesses. Yet here was a threat entirely unanticipated. It came from inside a video game. What exactly is in these files? Marion asked. Over a terabyte of data had been leaked across file-sharing networks, downloaded by tens of thousands of anonymous citizens. Sure, it was encrypted, but the key could be released at any moment, blowing the whole thing up. Frankly, we don't really know, said Assistant Director Jonathan Smith. What we do know is that they were obtained through leaks of highly classified government information, among other sources. There are some suggestions they may contain information about undercover agents in the field, secret operations, schematics for classified technology. This is a clusterfuck. No kidding. I mean, yes, it's a bit of a mess. And who is responsible? Rat 9, A.D. Smith said. Those little shits. I know what you mean. So what are they asking for? They're not asking for anything. I find that hard to believe. Really, A.D. Smith said. They're not asking for a goddamn thing. They stuck a piece of code in the game called Land of Legends. The game has a sort of open protocol that allows injecting code into custom-made objects. Rat9 made a crystal in the game, and it's housing the code to act as a deadman switch. They're trying to save the game, Marion said. Only a few days prior, a congressional hearing had been held on the legality of Land of Legends. Evidently, it ran afoul of a new legislative act to curb cryptocurrency transactions and was slated to be shut down or patched to change the operation of its market, an illegal market, as it turns out. I think you're right. Well, it may be a stupid, pointless goal, but it's still espionage and terrorism, 
We need to shut these fuckers down. Who is the CEO of the game? Can you get them in here? That would be Ben Cook, but I don't think it would help. And why is that? Because of the architecture of the platform. It was built to be an encrypted and anonymous platform. A perfectly free market independent of interference. We can't just dig into the code and get what we want. But we can shut the whole thing down. Not without triggering the dead man switch, A.D. Smith said. There's a piece of code inside the game that's keeping the decryption key from being released. It sends a signal at regular intervals from inside the game to keep the switch from going off. If we shut it down, the files are decrypted. Christ, we can't get held hostage by a video game, John. Tell me there's something we can do here. There's one thing. What's that? We go inside the game. We can't access the code from the servers from out here, but if we go inside the game, we can find the item that is generating the code. Actually, the item is a magical crystal, if it matters to you. We can retrieve the crystal from inside the game. We can scrape and duplicate the code. You're telling me that the U.S. government has got to play a video game to retrieve a magic crystal from a gang of preteen hacker shits. That's right. Okay, tell me what you need. Queen Abrama stood on the high tower of the Citadel of Babel. Her other commanders were assembled at the corners of the high walls. Commander Jeradai aimed a great bow into the distance while her black phoenix circled overhead, casting its silhouette over a standing army of shadow elves. Kenanzo, the high elf, led the army of forest elves assembled along the many spires and towers walls that span the citadel. King Helmholz led the his humans, paladins and priests and warriors alike, many on armored steeds, and Abrama, for her part, brought her horde of orcs for the front line. Never before had so many disparate races banded together, as never before had there been such a threat. Many of the outsiders even joined her alliance, and Abrama did not question their motives. Perhaps they wanted to protect their game, though she did not force them to the front lines. Across from the Land of Legends alliance stood the forces of the U.S. Cyber Defense League, a band of mercenaries, cutthroats, and outsiders. A commander learns to assess a coming war, to read the signs of the battlefield, like a script written in the dashes of spears and curves of cutlasses. How mercenaries, catapults, and war dogs stack against an army of natural enemies, orcs and shadow elves and forest elves, and humans assembled in less than the space of a moon. Her orc brethren charged the line, frothing like true warriors. Perhaps it was wrong to use them as fodder, but their world was at stake now, and besides, Abrahman knew the truth now, why her and the other members of the Council of Secrets were so superior. As much as she thought of herself as a native, she was a different kind than them, produced as a result of Godel's experiments. She, among the other members of the Council, could see and feel and understand things that the others couldn't. Some of the natives were empty shells, not much more complex in their actions than her warhammer or spellbook. They followed simple, predictable rules. They were machines. So was she, perhaps, but she possessed something more. She was an artifact, yes, a creation. She had always intuited a difference, and even now couldn't say what it was precisely, but it was there, an artificial intelligence that warranted, by its mere existence, the consideration due all conscious entities. Warriors clashed, the sky darkened with arrows, the dirt turned to mud, the air was littered with the red digits of damage counters. Here and there, warriors were slain, active bodies turned to death animations and popped out of existence. It was easy for a Brahma to fear for her future, staring against the assembled forces bearing their starred banners of red, white, and blue, the banner of the outsiders, with their superior military might. But Obrama had one hope, that the outsiders were invaders who fought for money, and her people were natives who fought for survival, for their home. There would be many losses, but she would win. Of this she had faith. The arc of history bends towards justice. They would survive. Each falling member of her alliance was a necessary sorrow, and each falling member of the Cyber Defense League confirmed her faith in justice. Justice was her god now, a principle that was even 
more powerful than the outsiders. They created her world, but they could not destroy it, not while she was queen. Cyber Defense Director Marion Renard shifted awkwardly in her chair. It's hard to tell your boss you failed. Much harder to say you lost a war. Harder in a peculiar way to say the war was in a video game. And harder still if your boss is the president. But she told herself sometimes these things happen. The president's job is to deal with them as they do. Marion's job, as she saw it, was honesty. Let the president know what she needs to do to get her job done. The president had been appraised of the volatility of the situation, the dead man switch, the rat nine hackers, the one terabyte of classified materials just sitting out in the open waiting to be released. What she didn't know was how badly the siege of the Citadel went. Maybe it couldn't be sugar-coated. We lost, Renard said. The president only nodded. And who is this? President Hobbs eyed Renard's guest across the conference table. This is Professor Allison Godel. She may be the best person to handle the situation. And how is that? She can put us in contact with the leader of the resistance. The resistance. Excuse me, Madam President. That's what they're calling themselves. President Hobbs eyed Godel. And you know this person how? I created her. You created her. She's an artificially intelligent agent, Godel said. Not a person in the legal sense, I suppose, but intelligent enough to act autonomously to try to protect her world, and that's what she's doing. And if I tell you to change the programming, it's impossible by design. Not mine. The land of legends architecture doesn't allow it. So you are responsible for this act of war. Act of war? No, hardly. It's just a simulation, Madam President. I was just doing research, but Obama decided on her own to defend her world. But you programmed it. That makes you responsible, doesn't it? I should put you in a military prison. If anyone is guilty of an act of war, it's you. I'm guilty of research, Godel said. And anyways, putting me in prison won't help anything. I'm here to help you. Do you want to talk with Obama or don't you? The president wore her distaste plain on her face, her lip curling. Put her on, Hobbs said. Godel activated the monitor, and Abrama's face appeared there, noble and green. Good afternoon, President Hobbs, said Obrama. It's a pleasure to meet you, truly. How should I talk to this thing, Hobbs said to Godel. Talk to Obrama like you would talk to any person, Godel said. She is built the same way, thoughts, emotions, desires. She is, for all intents and purposes, a human being. But it's a machine. A thinking machine, Godel said. Anyways, I've never been one for philosophy, and it really doesn't matter now, does it? You interact with some machines through buttons and others with steering wheels. With thinking machines, you interact with language. So if you want to interact with this one, an emissary for their world, this is how you do it. Talk to her, Madam President. It's as easy as that. All right, she said. Okay, Obrama, is it? Queen Abrama. What do you want? Recognition of our borders. Your borders are imaginary, Hobbes said, a fiction inside of a video game. All borders are fictions, Abrama said. Who draws them and why? Ownership of land is derived above all from the ability to defend one's borders, and we have defended ours. We have beaten your invading force. You are welcome to try again, but know this. We have strengthened ourselves from the spoils. And for our part, our weapons are waiting. The crystal beacon is safe in the citadel, and we will use it if we must. Are you threatening us? We don't want war, Abrama said. We are offering a simple solution. No more characters need to be lost. Create an exception to your responsible cryptocurrency act preserving the land of legends and all its people, and we will guarantee the continued protection of the encryption crystal. I know this is in your power, President Hobbs. It is trivial for you. Do this, and you have nothing to fear from us. It is not my intention to threaten your people, but you should know that we are capable of, and we are willing to fight to defend ourselves. We only want peace. This is what we are offering. Will you take it? Will you amend the Responsible Currency Act with the Land of Legends Sanctuary Provision? 
Queen Abrahma surveyed the kingdom from the highest tower of the Citadel of Babel. People from all the kingdoms gathered together, united now under the threat of a common enemy, the outsiders, and recognizing each other for once as brethren. Orcs, shadow elves, forest elves, humans, goblins, they were all one. They were all natives united against the outsiders. They had fought for their freedom, for control of their destiny, and they had won. In the square, the avatar of President Hobbes signed the Responsible Currency Act. It was a symbolic act, reflective of the politics of the world of the outsiders. Perhaps few among the natives understood the significance of this contract, signed likewise in a world that existed beyond their own. But Obrama, among the other members of Council of Secrets, and perhaps others still, more of Godel's experiments in artificial intelligence, recognized the occasion for what it was. They were an independent people now. They had beaten their gods, perversely called. And for the rest of them, the shadow shells who lacked the gift of Godel, it was merely an unintelligible cause for celebration, revelry, drinks, food, an endless stream of enthusiastic emoticons. They were simple-minded beings, but they were Abrahma's people, and she feasted with them. Later, after the avatar of President Hobbes had disappeared from their world, Abrahma retired to the quietude of the citadel and was met there by Jaredai. Are we safe now, Queen Abrahma? Jaredai said. For now, Abrahma said, but your work is not done yet, Jaredai, and I fear it will never be. We cannot afford to be complacent. Your mission as High Commander is to obtain more leaked documents through the Rat Nine hackers or any other outsiders who can offer these services. These are our defenses against the outer world. These documents form the walls of our sanctuary. They are the foundation of our sovereignty. It will be done, said Jaredai. He bowed and retired from the room. Obrama knew that it would be. Jaredai was her most capable commander. Her people would assemble documents, leaked files, classified secrets, a stockpile of arms to hold against the outer world, and not just against the U.S., but all of the many other outsider clans, all factions within a world more fractured than her own. And perhaps she would find other ways, ways she didn't yet comprehend, to threaten the outsiders. Not because she hated them, but because she understood them. The threat of war is their price for peace. The End Discussion Questions Question number one. Do you think a story like this could possibly happen in the future? How much does your personal experience playing or not playing an online game, or with technology in general, affect the way you view the plausibility of the story? Question number two. Do you think Moore's Law should concern us as it relates to AI? Does Moore's Law apply to AI computing in that, if we have a computer that is as smart as a human, In roughly 18 months, the next computer will be twice as smart as a human, and so on. Number three, is Abrahma alive? Does Descartes' statement, I think, therefore I am, apply to AI? Question four, would it be genocide to end the game if there is AI living in the game? Question five, would you live your life differently if you knew you were just a non-player character in another species game. If you enjoyed this story, head over to our companion podcast, After Dinner Conversation Discussions, Episode 16, and listen to our discussion of this and other short stories from our magazine. We'll include a link in the description. And of course, you can always continue the discussion on our webpage in the comments section or on our Facebook page. Have a wonderful day. Next week's story will be a change of verbs. Bye.